Welcome everybody. My name is Anne Dolan and I'm so glad that you're joining me tonight for um, thriving and sur sur surviving with the virtual learning practical strategies to make at home learning work for you. Boy, this is such a strange time we find ourselves in. So we have a lot to talk about and get through tonight. Um, this will be about a 40 minute presentation followed by a Q&A and a Q&A at the very end. Um, and it will also be interactive. So if you have a question that pertains to something that I've said throughout, please just put it in the chat box below and I'm happy to answer it. But again, we will reserve that time. Also, I have a lot of these strategies in an ebook that I put together called Homeschooling During COVID-19. And um, you can get that by texting 55444 and the words homeschool. And I have a brand new one coming out next week specific to virtual learning so if you text me at this number i'll make sure you get that next week as well so let's get started um as i mentioned we have a lot to talk about we're going to be starting out with setting up routines some easy to follow things that parents can do to help kids stay on track um, really about the six p's then we're going to talk about creating the ideal virtual learning space followed by keeping kids focused when they're online on encouraging our kids to ask questions. This is very important. And then what parents can do when they're balancing working from home and also have kids at home engaged in virtual learning. And perhaps the most important thing at the end of the day is to preserve our relationship with our kids and not make everything all about academics. So let's start out with routines. You know, routines are really important. Routines are the things that we do day in and day out. They, they tend to reoccur, so we know what to expect. And when we have routines in our life, they kind of put us on autopilot. And they're really good for kids because they're predictable. And kids thrive on a predictable lifestyle. It makes things easier for them. They know what to expect, so they're less likely to push back on you and say things like, I don't want to do it, or I didn't know I had to do this. Um, but here's the thing about routines. They actually require more time up front, setting them up. But as you go along, life gets easier. What I'm saying this year is that life will be very different. And as parents, we're actually going to have to put more time up front in setting up these routines for our kids than we would have in past years. And I think of it like the six Ps. It's this military saying that my husband always shared with me. He said, prior proper planning prevents or performance. And I think that's especially true of this year. So what does that look like in your family? Well, first, it starts with a conversation with your child, not at a time when you're stressed or rushed, but maybe setting aside time and saying, hey, Jimmy, can we talk about the school year? How about 730 tonight after dinner? So you're kind of putting your child um, in a position of strength because you're treating them kind of like an adult. You're discussing what this is going to look like. And you might start out by saying, it's going to be a different kind of year. How do you feel about it? You might even use these two magic words that I love called, I've noticed. I've noticed we tend to be, we tend to do better with routines. Meaning, when we have the same schedule day in and day out, it seems to go better. Let's talk about that. The next thing you'll want to do, if your child already has their schedule for the year, and their schedule means, well, from math, at 9 o'clock they have math from 9 to 10, language arts, say, from 10.30 to 11.30. That's what I mean by a schedule. It's awesome if you can sit down with your child at the same time each week. I love Sunday nights, um, usually followed by dinner on Sundays, to really plan ahead for the week. You can even do this now if your kids already have their schedule. So you'll want to take out a calendar. One of those big desk calendars is great for elementary school kids. Um, if they have a planner that they write in, that's fantastic. Really, it can be anything, but the idea is you want to talk them through each day. What's Monday going to look like for you? And write out each class that they have and what it's going to look like. How about Tuesday? How about Wednesday? And as I mentioned, this is, again, a little bit more time up front, but when kids tend to have a, when kids have a schedule, it's more predictable. You may also want to put in those things that happen after school. Maybe your child still goes to soccer practice, or perhaps they have a violin lesson. So every week, you're going to want to do this. Even if it's just a printout that your child has, this is a good conversation to have. Then each morning, just for five minutes, Take a few, take that time to ask, what's your day going to look like? 
Let's look at your schedule. What do you have coming up? You might also ask questions like, what do you have after school? So that they have to verbalize to you what's going on. It really helps kids plan ahead. And it especially helps kids that are anxious. And um, they, you know, if they don't know what's going on, they can tend to get nervous. And it also helps kids that tend to procrastinate and put things off because they have to have a schedule to go through. It might look something like this. Then when you look at the schedule, you'll also see these chunks of time for breaks. And we might think school actually might not be that different online. Sure, the instruction is different, but really they're going to school from nine to three o'clock. But are they really? Not so much. Because the thing is, kids are going to have these gaps in time. So they might have math, um, say from nine to 10, but they might have a break from 10 to 10.30. And then they go on to language arts. But when we see these gaps in our kids' schedule, we have to figure out what is it that they're going to do during those breaks. They can do one of two things. They can do high dopamine activities or low dopamine activities. And let me explain what I mean by that. There is this chemical we have in our brain when we do something good and it's called dopamine. And dopamine makes us feel good. It's like a pleasure chemical. So when we do something that we like, we get lots of squirts of dopamine. And there are these neurons in our brain and these neurons transmit the dopamine. So there's a transmitting neuron and there's a receiving neuron. And the more dopamine we have coming to the receiving neuron, the more this receiving neuron wants to get all this dopamine. We get lots of dopamine when we do things like, for kids, they're on TikTok, they're on YouTube, they're on Snapchat, they're on Instagram. Uh, it could be just that they're texting with their friends or they're on video games, or they might be watching a highly stimulating TV show. These are all things that they could be doing during breaks, but they're not ideal. And the reason is that when you say, all right, put TikTok down and go on to math, it's gonna be really hard to pull them off of that screen. That's because there's lots of dopamine. And when that receiving dopa neuron doesn't have all that dopamine, that neuron says, wait a second, I want more. Come on, keep doing that thing. So that's why kids are often in that mode where they can't stop. And so we don't want them to do those things during the day because it's then hard to focus them on school. So what we do want to do is fill that time with low dopamine activities. You know, those could be things that aren't so, so stimulating. Um, it might be that they're reading a book online. They're doing arts and crafts, maybe a puzzle, playing with friends. All right, so we talked about um, setting up a routine and so kids know what to expect. Let's talk about setting up the, the, the learning space itself. You know, it's really interesting. I think everybody on, and their brother is on Wayfair or Ikea buying new desks. I think that desks are really like toilet paper in a way. They are the new toilet paper. Everybody wants one and they're, they're getting sold out. I've talked to so many parents that have said, I had a desk in my cart in Ikea and I went to check out and pay for it. It wasn't there anymore. Um, so for that reason, it, this is something you want to get set up sooner rather than later. You want to set up the space in a place that has really strong Wi-Fi. This is important. And it doesn't have to be a fancy desk that you buy on Ikea or on Wayfair. It can be an old card table you get out of your basement. That's perfectly fine. It could be a portion of your dining room table that this becomes your child's new virtual learning space. But wherever it is, this space should really only be for learning. It shouldn't be that um, your child is also playing video games here during break. That's not good. You wanna train the brain to think, when I walk to this learning space every morning, this is where I do learning. So your brain starts to associate that place with learning. Now, the place doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be totally quiet. And in fact, for some kids, totally quiet isn't good. I talked to a mom a couple weeks ago that said, she said the spring didn't go so well for her. She squirreled her seven-year-old off in um, this old guest bedroom they rarely used upstairs. And she said, he kept coming down the stairs, checking in, getting, some, getting a snack, um, asking what I was doing. And she realized that it was just like too isolated for him. And she ended up putting him, setting up this little table in her living room and that was his space. And that worked out better 
because it was on the first floor, which was where she was working, and she could check in on them every now and then. So it was quiet, but not too quiet. I talked to a mo another mom that said in the spring, she has four kids, it didn't go so well because she didn't know how long she'd be in this virtual learning. So it was kind of like a hodgepodge. One day you're here, one day you're there, one day on the, you're on the couch, you know. And so she said this year she decided to set all four kids up in the basement. They each have their own desks and um, they don't have their phones during the school day. So that's what she decided to do. There is no one right place, but I would encourage you to make sure that it's a place where you can check in on your child and make sure they're engaged. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Oh, and one more thing I often share with kids, or at least I did in the spring, your school day isn't over until your designated workspace, your DWS, is tidied up. Then you know your day is done. All right, so we need a desk, but we also need a really comfortable chair. Not like some old dining room folding chair you pulled from your basement. That wouldn't be ideal because kids are going to be sitting in this for a long period of time. So a comfortable chair like an office chair is great. For fidgety kids, a ball chair. There's also these bands that you can put on the legs of a chair that kids can um, move their feet with. And that also helps to keep them focused. This space should have headphones for your child. An analog clock because studies show that when kids see the hands moving on the clock, they're more able to judge time. It helps kids with time management. And the other thing kids need in their space is just an index card with URLs and passwords written on it. I can't tell you how many kids we've worked with in the spring that couldn't remember how to log into certain sites. And kids will get lots of sites that they have to log into. So at the beginning of the year, make sure they have that accessible to them and to you. A couple other things they'll need. Um, one is a student planner, and I'm a huge fan of kids writing down what they have to do. Many students will tell us, Mrs. Dolan, don't worry, I can remember that. And here's the thing, they can't all the time. So they need a place to write it down. This is a, actually a really great planner. You can find this on Amazon. Oh, and by the way, if you text that number, I'll also send you all this supply information. And it's 55444 and um, just type in the word homeschool. So I love this planner. You can get it on Amazon. I love it when kids have erasable highlighters and also erasable colored pencils. And I'll tell you why in just a second. And I really encourage kids to get an accordion binder. I think these have really taken the place of so many traditional three ring binders that kids used in years past. First of all, they're not going to have a lot of papers. Secondly, they still need an organized way to, to file them and it needs to be easy for them. So every tab should be labeled with the subject name. And then when they get the paper, it should go in the back of this, that section. So everything's just chronologically organized. All right, so we talked about routines. We talked about setting up the space. Let's talk about kids staying focused while they're online, because there's lots of ways to do that. Um, I am a firm believer that if your kid needs pressure, and you know your kid is a kid that needs that calming sense of pressure, if they're the kid that's always clicking their mechanical pencil lots of times, or maybe they're twirling their hair or they're rocking back and forth in, the, or in their seat, they're spinning around in a swivel chair, they could be tapping their foot, they, they tend to always be moving. Those are kids that are craving sensory stimulation. And if we do things that we normally do, like, Jimmy, put that pen down, stop playing with that. It doesn't always work out so well because they'll find something else to play with. The reason kids do that is that when they have pressure, when they get that sensory stimulation, it tends to relax them and calm them down a bit. So instead of taking it away, let's give it to them. And we can give it to them in the form of fidgets. And let me share with you one of my new favorite ones. Um, it's called Cool Cats, and you can find this on Amazon. But I love it because it's basically like um, the world's best stress ball. And it, it's like a moldable stress ball that kids love to hold in their hand. And um, it's so easy to give them pressure, and it's not distracting. The other thing I love, if your kid's a fidgety sitter, is wiggle feet. And wiggle feet is just these sensory cushions that go by the bottom of the chair and kids can put their feet in them and they can stay focused that way. Now, 
I mentioned just a second ago that I love erasable colored pencils, and here's why. If we can give our kids colored pencils or just a pencil and something to doodle with while the teacher is talking, it's going to help them a lot. There's lots of research that shows that doodlers actually pay more attention and retain more than non-doodlers. And that's important because we want our kids to be engaged in learning, not just kind of like checking out when the teacher's talking. And they're more likely to be engaged if they have something to take notes on and they're actively taking notes. And we might think, does a third grader take notes? Yes, a third grader can take notes. So this is like the, the uh, modern version of taking notes on just, you know, like a blank piece of paper. These are called doodle notes. And I love them because they're super interesting to kids. They're basically just like cool templates that kids can jot information into. And kids love them because they can also color them in. They can draw pictures that help them to remember. If you go to one of my favorite websites called teacherspayteachers.com and just type in free doodle, doodle notes, you can find some free templates. Also, doodlenotes.org has some free ones, but most of them you have to pay for, but they're only a couple dollars and they're super helpful to kids. The other thing I encourage, and this is more for older kids. So if you have like a middle school, a high school student, you'll want to make sure that, and true for elementary kids too, all of the other windows at the bottom of their screen need to be, um, need to be gone. They can't have any other windows open because open windows are inherently distracting. Also, if your child has a phone, putting the phone in another room and maybe just using quickly on breaks to check a text message or two is okay. Not to go on like Snapchat though, that could be really distracting. The other thing that I find helpful is to have a whiteboard in the area. And a whiteboard is great because kids can jot down anything that they need to be doing or need to get done during their independent period. All right, so number four, asking questions. This is actually really important. And it's something that we don't often think about when we're thinking about getting ready for school. Because we're, as parents, we're thinking about setting up the space, um, we're thinking about a comfortable chair, all of those things. But actually, once school starts, the most important thing we can encourage our kids to do is to stay engaged with the teacher. And the best way to do that is to ask questions. This is important because in a traditional school, school day, the teacher can walk around the class and see what the kids are doing and notice if um, Emily isn't on task. She can see that John hasn't finished his work. However, when you're in a Zoom class or whatever platform you're on and you're, you're, um, you're muted, the teacher is going to have a really hard time knowing if you're engaged. In fact, I was just talking to a teacher the other day. And she said um, her school district has gotten them a software called Aristotle that allows them to see what else kids have open on the screen. So she said she and many of our teachers have split screens and on one is what they're doing for their instruction. And on the other one, they can see like Jimmy has Netflix open and Susie has Pinterest open or whatever it is, they can see all the applications they have running which shows us the sign of the times for sure. Um, so it used to be teachers could see those things, see what kids are doing just by walking in the room, but now that's not possible. So it's gonna be the child's responsibility to ask questions. There's an important time kids need to ask questions. There's teacher directed instruction where the teacher is giving the lesson, but then there's also gonna be independent work. Before kids go to that independent work, if they don't understand something, they need to be using the raise hand feature and asking the question. And instead of saying, we can coach our kids on this, I don't understand. It would be better if the child says, Mrs. Smith, I don't understand how to do number two. So it's kind of more specific than I don't get this. Um, ideally during that independent time, we want our kids to get all their work done and they're not saving it to do later in the night. Really, when school is done, school should be done. If your child is hesitant to help, to ask for help, that's okay. There's two things you can do about it. One, 
you, if your child is really young, you can write an email to the teacher and use those special words called I've noticed and say something like, I've noticed um, Emily is really nervous to ask a question during class. Do you have any suggestions? So instead of saying, um, you're making Emily nervous about asking a question or you, which can often put people on the defensive, by just saying what you've observed, it really puts you on the same team. And then you can brainstorm ways to help. If the child is old enough and they can write the email, it's better if they write to Mrs. Smith and say, Mrs. Smith, um, I'm unsure about how to do number two in math. What's the best way um, for me to get help with this? And I like it when the child writes the email, if they're capable of it, because if they get a positive response back, they're more likely to do it again in the future. And teaching advocacy to kids in elementary school is so powerful for when they get older. So they're able to step out of their shell a little bit and ask for help. All right, so let's talk about doing all of this when we're also working from home, because honestly, this is the trickiest thing of all. Now, certainly if there's another adult in the home, it's so much easier because we can tag team. It's kind of like block scheduling in school. Like you have math in high school, you have math from eight to 9.30, and then you have science from 9.30 to 11. It can work like that with parenting too. Um, there's one go-to parent at, in that first block from say um, 8.30 to 10 and another one after that. So when kids know who to go to when they need help, that's really awesome. Um, we can also make sure that not only do they know to, who to go to for help, but they also know when it's okay. Because the truth is, as working parents, there are times we cannot be disrupted. If we're on a super important conference call, or, oh, we just have to get that report due, and it's, we have to get that report finished, and it's due in 15 minutes. For that reason, I recommend using red light, green light, yellow light system. It's basically a visual for kids to know when it's okay to come in and when it's not such a good time. So if you have your own home office, you might stick up um, a piece of construction paper, red, to say, I'm really busy right now, come back later. Green means go, come on in. You can also use yellow, but that's a little bit harder for kids to jump that are with older kids. If you don't have your own place, you could just use cups of three different colors or highlighters. It doesn't really matter what it is, but the idea is that a visual is always, always better than a verbal. So when we say, when we practice with kids, um, when come, you know, when to come and ask for help, for me and give them different situations, it kind of makes it fun. But that's better than saying, hey, Susie, I'm gonna be on a conference call for the next half hour. Um, she won't remember that. So this is a better way of making sure that kids understand. I'm a huge fan of visuals. I like visuals so much better than verbal reminders. And for that reason, checklists work really well. When our kids are going to hockey every day and they have certain things they need to bring, it's better if we have a little list by the door with maybe those three things that they check as they're leaving. That's a visual. And that's better than saying, oh, don't forget your skates, um, your equipment, and be sure to bring a bottle of water. That's kind of in one ear and out the other. But if you do have these visual reminders, please know that after a while, they'll kind of blend in with the woodwork. So you might have to move them. I call this sparkleizing. That means that you might take that same checklist and move it to another part of the door or put a piece of pink paper behind it just so it looks different and doesn't blend in anymore. Um, oh, and also I wanted to mention that um, our time, I mentioned, you know, we're gonna have to put in more time up front. That is definitely true um, when we're working from home. So in the morning, we're gonna have to put in more time making sure our kids are logged in, they're focused, they're on the right account, and they're ready to go. We're gonna have to front load our time with our kids into the morning. But I also wanna say at the end of the day, all of these things are super important. However, the most important thing is to preserve our relationship with our kids because it can be defined 
by lots of stress and tension and a whole lot of um, more struggles because we're all in this, so, this incredibly strange situation and it's just stressful for everybody, for us, for our kids and for teachers too. And for that reason, so that we can dial back that tension just a bit, I always encourage parents to focus on, um, focus on just getting things done, focus on the completion and not the quality. So completion would be that kids are online, they're focused and they're getting their work done and not as much that their work is perfect. Every word is spelled correctly. Every math problem is right. I like to leave the quality to the, the teacher. When the teacher knows you know, um, that Emily is having a hard time with there, there, and there, she can do a mini lesson on those things. And by just focusing on getting work done, we're not nitpicking our kids. We're not engaging in power struggles over quality. For older kids, I really like the blind eye strategy. And this means that there's some give and take in the relationship. You don't want to micromanage everything because that creates lots of power struggles. So instead, you might say, look, I'm willing to turn a blind eye with Netflix if you're willing to do these two things every day. And those, these two things might be getting up on time and logging into your first class on time. So you're saying, look, I can't control everything. I know you're gonna stay up late watching Netflix, but what I, what's important to me is that you're up on time and logged into your first class. Spending time with our kids daily, even if it's for a short period of time, is really important right now. And that includes family dinners. If we can do family dinners a few nights a week, it's awesome because we get to have conversations with our kids that ideally don't involve academics. Um, and if you're stuck or having meaningful conversation, one thing that I've personally loved doing over the years with my kids is um, a little game called Kids Daily Dilemmas. And this is just basically a little container with a bunch of questions. Um, you know, you're walking down the street and you find $20. You see the person that dropped it, but you can't quite catch up to them. What do you do? And so kids have to talk about how they would handle different situations. And it really gets kids talking and it gets kids talking to you without discussing academics. So at the end of the day, we really want to do two, three things to get ready for the school year. We want to set up a really good designated workspace for our kids. We want to um, preemptively solve problems, and that means that we want to talk about their weekly schedule once a week, and that's a longer conversation, followed by daily check-ins um, to make sure that they have their schedule, they're ready for their day, and that they're online and they're focused and they're engaged. And then lastly, we want to make this as positive as possible, even though this is a very strange situation for everything. We want to do our very best to preserve our relationships with our kids. All right, so in just a second, I will go to questions. There's a Q&A box. So please feel free at this time to type any questions that you have in the Q&A. And I wanted to remind you again, um, this is the ebook I mentioned, and I'm going to be sending you the new one on virtual learning next week. But this one also has lots of great things in it. And you can get it um, by texting 55. 444 and the message um, homeschool to get the ebook. All right, so let me go into our questions. And um, as somebody said, they missed the, missed the first part of it. Will it be recorded? And the answer is yes. Um, this, has, this will be recorded and it will be sent to everyone on the list. All right, so I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Um, anybody have something that I can answer? Or Chrissy or Jen, is there something that I didn't quite get to that you would like me to talk about today? Oh, I see a bunch of questions that just rolled in. Chrissy and Jen, do you want me to answer these or do you have something specifically you want me to talk about? No, I think you can answer questions okay. and we can go that direction. Okay, great. So um, somebody said you mentioned having a designated workspace. It shouldn't also be where they play video games. Um, do, should I set up two workstations? And the answer is yes. If you have the child's workstation in the room where they play video games and they're staring at their Xbox or 
it's just out in the open for them to see, it's going to be inherently distracting. You want it, ideally, either put all of the Xbox stuff away um, so they don't see all that stuff or just move their space to a different area so their brain knows this is learning and their attention isn't divided by other things. How do you manage multiple children um, when working with one and another is demanding attention? Oh boy, I hear you. And this is, this is the hardest thing when you have you know, more than one child and they all want your attention. I would set up a schedule and I would say to them, all right, I'm gonna work with um, you know, John at this time and then when I'm done, I'm gonna come to you and then I'm gonna come over to you. But when kids know where they are in line, it makes it a little bit easier for you. Also, if they're distracting each other, I would not put them at the same table. Certainly, if you don't have a choice, you can get, I have these in the list of things that I'm gonna send you. They're like um, these cardboard study carols and, and often in schools we use them in testing situations so kids are copying from one another. But they're really, really great for um, multiple kids sitting at one table because um, they're kind of like a, a visual divider. But if that's not possible and um, you can't, ideally you want them to be in separate places. If you can't do that, then there's gonna need to be some type of divider at the table. The other thing you can do is if they're really young children and they don't have that much work, is to keep them busy doing something else. And you can set up stations kind of like, I'm not sure if you've ever been in a Montessori classroom, but Montessori is really big, especially for younger kids. And it's a method of education. And basically kids go from station to station to learn things. So in your house, you can make it um, a different, a, an environment kind of like that. So you could have like a puzzle station. You could have a book station. You could have a Lego station. So that kids have something else to do when you're working with that one child. So I would give them structure to it and also give younger kids something to do. Um, do you recommend blue light block glasses for kids? Hmm. I'm not that familiar with them. Um, I know that there has been research on using different colored lenses for reading and the research has not shown that that helps, but I'm not sure if that's, you might be talking about the blue light from the computers, I think but I'm not sure. So um, I'm sorry, I don't have more information on that one. Um, do you have any specific tips for preschool age kids? And yes, that's really where I would set up stations. Kids cannot attend to very much time online. In fact, you know, when we think about what is the optimal amount of time kids can be focused, um, and it really it's no more than 25 minutes. And then for kids that have attention difficulties, take their age and add a minute to it. So like a nine-year-old, it might be just 10 minutes. Um, otherwise, they might be zoning out. For, so for preschool kids, they're not going to really be able to engage that long online. And so for that reason, I make sure that there's movement in between. That you know when they're done with something, they can go to a station. They can get up and move. That's going to be really important for young kids. Thoughts on basement versus bedroom? Um, yes, for a kindergartner and a third grader. I personally don't love the bedroom for um, kids to set up really their virtual learning space. The bedroom is inherently distracting. For one reason or another, kids will find other things to do aside from schoolwork when it's in their bedroom. Also, it tends to be a place that, unless, and I take this back, if your child is super focused, you've never had a problem with them, they do work all the time in their bedroom and they're perfectly capable, that's fine. Not all kids are like that. So if you are not sure if the bedroom is going to work, I would not put your child in the bedroom. I would put them somewhere if you have a townhouse or a two-story house and you're on the first floor, I'd put them somewhere on the first floor, especially for a kindergartner and third grader. A basement is okay, if there are separate spaces and you're also working down there. But I think that would be an, a place that might be too quiet for young kids. Um, any su a suggestion? Oh, one mom said, um, thank you, this is great. A suggestion would be to have your kid each morning get a water bottle ready to have at their desk to avoid them getting up. Yes, that is so true. 
if you have a little grazer in your house and they're constantly, you know, getting, I need a drink, I need a snack. First thing in the morning, they pick out, they get their water bottle ready, not you, they do this. They pick out their snack, they put it at their little desk space and they are ready to go. And that, you're right, it prevents kids. Same with all their materials. You know, ideally get something like a shower caddy where it can be portable when needed and they have all their materials in that thing, in the shower caddy. I personally also like that kids treat this like normal school and they have a backpack and they put all of their things in the backpack. So if they're studying at like your kitchen table and you don't want your kitchen table to look like a schoolyard, it's their job to clean up at the end of the day and put their things in their backpack. That's another good use of space. So yes, thank you for sharing that about the water bottle. All right. Um, one parent says, my seven-year-old has really resisted assignments, resisted assignments in the spring while we were learning virtually. She did not meet, want me to be the one telling her to do the work. It became a really big power struggle. And this time I'm wondering how to encourage her to do her work without nagging. I would bring this question to her and say, I noticed last year I nagged you a lot and I didn't like doing that. And I know you didn't like that either. I want to make sure that you get your work done. Let's talk about how we could do this differently this year. And I would open the dialogue and see what she says, you know, and I know she's young, a seven year old, that's for sure, but she will be able to tell you what she didn't like. And I would honestly take uh, what she says to heart and see what you can do to change it. So you might say, um, things like, I want to make sure that you get started in the morning. This is a non-negotiable. I'm going to be online with you and I want to make sure you're off to a good start. Um, I would like to check in with you at lunch. That might be another non-negotiable. However, maybe a negotiable is that you don't check in with her on all the breaks, for example. Um, I'd also bring it up to the teacher and, and let the teacher know this was a real issue last year. What do you suggest this year? But instead of telling her what to do, I would really start out with a discussion around it. It might make her a little bit more responsible because she feels like she has a say in it and she can be a little bit more independent. Do you recommend posting resources around like multiplication tables for elementary or does that become too much, of a, too much clutter? I think that's a fabulous idea. Um, I have nothing wrong with putting a multiplication chart or a ruler, um, any of those types of things in um, a space. And it might be that you have one space for reference materials that if your child needs them, they can go to them. I think that's a great idea. Let's see. Well, let me scroll down here. Um, suggestions for pre-readers or early readers and helping them be more independent so we can work. Yes, um, I really love what Audible's done. They have a ton of free books now that are read-alouds, especially for younger kids that used to cost money and now they're free. So I would set her up on a couple of read-alouds, meaning you can either let her listen to the book, get her earphones and iPads so that she can listen along, or there's actually research that shows that when kids follow along, and they listen, this actually was research not done on preschoolers though, but older kids. Um, they improve their fluency and their comprehension more than if they read the book by themselves. That was a little bit too hard for them. So I would recommend either getting them on Audible, letting them pick the book, not you pick it, but they pick it so they can listen while you're doing work, or they can also listen and follow along um, I would set up a little reading station for them, that little Montessori approach. And if you want them to be online, there's lots of websites for younger kids like ABC Mouse that are low dopamine. They're not high dopamine, they're low dopamine. And that would be a good thing as well. Let's see. Um, how do I set up my child's work supplies when younger want so that my younger kids don't get into it? but it's easily accessible to the school age child. Oh boy, so yes, I can see why that would be a problem. What I might do is be super clear to your two and your four year old that this is only for your older child and I would give them the exact same materials if, that, if that's what they want, give them the erasable highlighter, give them the um, erasable um, colored pencils 
and set up a little art station for them, just like the Montessori approach. Ask them, what would you like in it? Let's go around the house and find a couple of things that might interest you. And, and it's hard to have that conversation with a two-year-old, but they'll pick a few art supplies that they might want in their station that are very similar to what your older child has. And um, I would set them up separate, ideally a separate room, and they can even have their own school box with their names on it. So they see that this, these are their materials, not their older kids. What top three stations would you recommend for younger children, specifically kindergarten? Well, it depends what your child is like. If you have a child who likes building, I would absolutely pull out Legos, um, whatever type of building supplies you have, and make that a station. There's actually lots of logic and critical thinking that goes into building. And I think it's great for math skills at a very basic level. So I would create um, a building station. If you have a child that likes books and reading, I would set up um, a reading station with some books. And I would also set up an arts and crafts station with basic things to help with fine motor skills, like you know the, the preschool scissors that kids get that aren't dangerous, um, stickers, anything that your child would like to do. Um, I think that's great for fine motor skills. All right, so I think those are all the questions. Um, and there's a few questions in the chat. Oh, um, I see those. Mind answering some of those? Sure, okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, one mom says, what, what if your child refuses to sit at the computer? I would, I would really want to know why, you know, if you say, why won't you sit at the computer? Why questions I haven't found to be that great for kids. They have a hard time, you know, wrapping their heads around. So what they do something wrong and we say, why did you do that? It's really hard for them to answer because it's such a big question. Um, so you might want to start out by saying, um, what is it about you know, being online that you don't like instead of why, or um, what happened in April that made you nervous about being online. But I might try to really get to the root of it instead of forcing it. Um, I, what I've seen personally, we've had, because we do a lot of online instruction with the kids that we see. We also do in-home instruction, but for our kids um, that were struggling with online instruction, the parents assumed, well, having an online tutor would be more of the same. And actually, we found that wasn't true at all. What happened was when these kids were in these large environments, like 20 kids in a, a Zoom room or whatever their online platform was, some of them developed a lot of social anxiety and they didn't want to be seen. So they wanted their video off. They didn't want, um, they didn't want to be heard. So they turned their sound off. And it was really the social anxiety that was creating a lot of it. Um, it's different. It's completely different when you're working with somebody one-on-one -on -one and you've developed a personal relationship with them. So that's why, for that reason, I wanted to get to the root of it. How do you suggest handling the child getting distracted or off track? So let's say that you're, you know, you're working and you look across the room and your child is not you know, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Um, there's a couple of things you can do. One is you could just ignore it. And I know this sounds strange to say, but the more we redirect our kids and the more um, we interfere and nag, it doesn't always help the problem. Sometimes it can make it worse because it creates a big power struggle between us and our kids. Um, instead, I would, um, I would look for patterns. So if you see it more, for example, in the math time, it's just specific to math. And instead of saying, hey, get focused, pay attention. Why aren't you looking at your teacher? Um, you should be paying attention right now. I would approach it after the fact. And I would say, if you see a problem in math, I noticed um, that math was a little bit hard for you today. It was hard. I noticed that focus was more difficult. Uh, you know, can you tell me about that? Or did something specific happen in math? And you might find that it happens in subjects where kids are not the strongest. 
It often happens a lot in cumulative subjects where one skill builds upon another. And we see this a lot in math, for example. If you miss something in math, and you don't understand it, and now you're got onto some, you've gone on to something else and you missed that foundational part, it's really hard for you to catch up on your own. You need somebody to re-explain it to you, like a parent, the teacher, a tutor, somebody else to go back and figure out you know, what it is that you're missing. Um, so for that reason, I would, I would, before you intervene and say, hey, pay attention, I would try to see if you have patterns. And then I would also ask your child, would you like a reminder when I see that you're off track? If your child says, oh, that would be great, <laughs> then fine, you know, but pick the battles. Maybe only mention it once during a class instead of all the time. That's when power struggles occur. All right, so one parent says, um, where did that go? Hold on, sorry. How much should we pay attention to what they are learning during the day? Should we give them more independence and let them learn on their own um, what they would normally experience in school? I have a first grader or a preschool, or should we focus on one over the other? And, you know, I don't know. <laughs> should you focus on one over the other? I'm not sure, but I would say that first grade is certainly where there might be more foundational skills, more academics taught. Um, so certainly you wanna make sure your first grader is online, they're focused when they get started. And I would have specific check-in points. Um, so at lunchtime, instead of saying, oh, tell me what you learned today, that's kind of like a why question. It's really hard for kids to answer. Instead, you might say, um, oh, I saw that you were working on subtraction in math. Um, how are you feeling about that? You could ask a question like that. But for the most part, my personal opinion is that we wanna get kids started and then we wanna take a step back. There's naturally gonna be more engagement when you have a preschooler or you have a kindergartner or a first grader, but by the time your kids are really in third grade, really it, it should be like the teacher handling it. And if you see that your child is disengaged, definitely talk to the teacher about it, but my experience has shown me that we get kids to be actually more invested in their own learning when we stay, take a step back as a parent and don't try to micromanage. So I think your question is a good one. Um, and you're right, you know, should we give independence? And the answer is whenever possible, yes. Do you have any suggestions on how to facilitate social interaction with an only child during the day? And yes, um, I, I just mentioned the lunch time. You could set up a lunch bunch for your child so that she or he has a little group and they can eat lunch together. I think that's a perfectly good thing to do. If there are extended breaks, perhaps they could you know, do Legos together if you have Legos set up at your house and that child has Legos set up at their house. Um, if, your kid, if your child's able to do something after school, play with kids in the neighborhood, be outside the house, that's really ideal. So, you know, the more we can get our kids interacting with other kids, the better, especially as they get older. So when kids are like fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, those middle school years, that's when their social development and their brain really is on fire. And everything about virtual learning flies in the face of what middle schoolers know and what their brains want. Their brains want them to learn by interaction, but we're saying, sorry, you're gonna do virtual learning. And that's really, really difficult. So especially as kids get older, we want them to interact more. Um, my son struggled with the social anxiety you mentioned a moment ago. What suggestions do you have in addressing this so that he has he is more comfortable being on camera and audio. You know, I would first find out from the teacher how she's gonna run her class this year. Because I actually talked to a lot of teachers last year who didn't even have the kids on camera, didn't have them on audio either. Um, so I would find out, are they on camera? Are they um, also on audio? And then I would address the question to her before school even starts. My son struggled with um, social anxiety last year. What do you recommend? 
Also, if this is a barrier to learning and he just flat out refuses, I, we worked with a lot of kids in the spring where we said to the parent, you know what, this is becoming such a huge issue and it's interfering with learning. Please go to the teacher and say, you know, this child is not going to have his video on. And it might be just for certain classes because we found that it was only, in, it was, you know, more in certain times of the day than others. Um, but I think it's an okay thing first to ask the teacher how will class be conducted and then set using those words I've noticed. I noticed in the spring this was an issue. What do you suggest? All right, so let me go back to Q&A make sure I got everything here. Um, and yes, and also the social anxiety thing. That's not as much my field as it is for a psychologist, but if you want to email me that question, I will connect with one of my psychologist friends and make sure you get a better answer than I gave you. And my email is ann, A-N-N, at ectutoring.com. And that goes for anybody out there. If you have a personal question you would like me to answer, I am more than happy. I'm so fast on email, you let me know and I will get right back in touch with you. All right, so Jen and Chrissy, I think I've gone through all the questions. Is there anything else you wanted me to address before we call it a night? Well, this was fantastic. I feel like I have now a shopping list of school supplies that I need to go <laughs> pick up for my kids to have their own little space um, and planning. I am so grateful for that. Um, I don't have anything, Chrissy. I don't know if you had any other questions you were interested in asking. I'll let Chrissy. Um, hi, Chrissy. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, this was awesome, and thank you so much for providing sure. this for our uh, members. I think everyone um, has a lot that we've all learned and a lot wow. of actions that we need to take away. And great. I really appreciate your time. This was really amazing. Oh, thank you so much. It was great to talk to everybody. And thank you all for your nice comments at the end. I, I so appreciate that. I wish everybody an amazing school year, the best it can be. Um, if I can help you in any way, feel free to reach out. And I wish you um, a wonderful end to your summer as well. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye-bye.